Hi, I'm David Busick. Welcome to Way Truth Life. We are in session five of our seven week study of discipleship as a journey of grace. In the last session, we discussed the nature of sin and the damaging effects sin has on our world and in our lives. But what is the origin of sin? The Bible says sin originates from our inborn nature. Paul writes to the Ephesian church, all of us once lived among them in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of flesh and senses, and we were by nature children of wrath, like everyone else. Throughout his New Testament letters, Paul explicitly teaches that human beings are born with a disobedient and sinful nature. We do not learn to sin. Nobody has to teach us to sin. There is no Sinner 101 class to attend. It comes naturally, and we are quite good at it. Jesus said, for out of the heart come evil intentions, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, slander. The heart is the source that defiles. Sin comes from the heart of people. You see a small child, barely old enough to walk, why do they act the way they do? Why are they so selfish? Why do they throw a temper tantrum when they don't get their way? A child is not a sinner because of their upbringing. They haven't lived long enough for their examples to affect them to that degree. A child is a sinner because sin comes from the heart. It is inbred. They don't have to be taught to be selfish. They do it naturally. Sin on display is an expression of what is already on the inside of a person. King David confessed this. Indeed, I was born guilty, he said, a sinner when my mother conceived me. It is the empirical fact of original sin. What does this look like theologically? Every person is created in the image of God, and God is holy and good. As originally created, humanity reflected the divine nature. But the source of holiness and goodness was not inherently from us. It was derived from God. Another way to say it is that essentially humanity is good because we are made for God, but existentially we are sinful, alienated from the life of God by our choices. Essentially good, existentially rebellious. This is original sin. We have a nature that we are born with. It's not a thing in us needing to be removed like a bad gallbladder. It is our disposition toward pride and self-centeredness. It is our inborn tendency toward violence, ego, self-sufficiency, and self-preservation. It is narcissism of the highest order. We have more than a bad record we have a fallen nature. And God's grace is needed to provide deliverance from and healing of the condition of sin and the acts of sin, original and actual. For this, we need both justification and sanctification. We need to be reformed and given a radical renovation of our hearts. We must be forgiven of our sins, made alive in Christ, and have our hearts purified by faith. The result is a recovery of the full image of God that was lost. I have come to believe that the wrong question to ask about the health of the church is, how many people are attending? The better question, or at least moving in the right direction, is to ask, what are these people like? Because when someone becomes a Christian, the goal for them is not only to learn how to follow Christ, but actually to live Christ-like lives. This is the goal of all discipleship on the journey of grace. The act or process of becoming like Jesus is sanctification, and it is made possible by sanctifying grace. In the Greek language, sanctification is related to the word holy or hagios. The good news of the gospel is not only that we will go to heaven when we die, but that the offer of abundant life in God's kingdom is for now right where we are. God's plan is that his image in us that was marred by the fall should be restored to all of its beauty and glory, that we would become his masterpiece, 
reflecting Christ-likeness in what we think, in what we say, and what we do. That is called sanctification, and that is what we are becoming. It's not optional for a growing Christian. When a person buys a car, they're informed by the salesperson that there is standard equipment and there are optional accessories. They know that they're gonna get a steering wheel, seat belts, and rear view mirrors because that is standard equipment. Every car has them. However, if they want automatic windows, alloy wheels, and a sunroof, they have to ask for it. Why? Because those are optional accessories. Not every car has them. Sanctification is not an optional accessory for a disciple of Jesus. It is standard equipment for every model. Becoming like Jesus is expected because growth is not an option. We are always growing towards something. We're always in the process of being spiritually formed. Again, Paul affirms this in Romans 12 when he said, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Conformed or transformed, those are our only two alternatives. If we're not being transformed or changed from the inside out by the renewing power of God, then we are being conformed. We're being shaped and molded by the forces opposed to God that are loose in the world. The question is not if you are going to be spiritually formed. The question is, will what form you? If God is not forming us, there is a spiritual enemy. There's an adversary, the evil one who is perfectly happy to configure our lives. Simply put, the world apart from God deforms and malforms people. God reforms and transforms. That's why sanctification or becoming like Jesus is so important. So how does discipleship happen? Do we automatically begin to grow in our spiritual life after our salvation? When someone becomes a Christian, is there an immediate, in-depth change of habits and attitudes and character formation? Do Christians grow by time alone and willpower alone? Because our relationship with God is personal, are disciples of Jesus better off working solo? Well, let's start to answer the questions with this truth. Disciples of Jesus are born and made. Saving grace changes our relational status with God, our eternal destiny, and introduces the power and work of the Holy Spirit in our life. But as we see from New Testament teachings as a new Christian, we are not yet mature in our character. Being a Christian does not automatically translate into becoming like Christ. Development is needed. Virtue is grown over time through specific practices. In light of these realities, let's consider a biblical framework of how spiritual growth takes place through sanctifying grace. One, spiritual growth begins at salvation, but we continue to grow in grace throughout our lives. There is a difference between sanctification and entire sanctification. The debate always seems to be whether sanctification is instantaneous or gradual. Is there a crisis moment or is it a process? The answer is both. Sanctifying grace begins the moment we experience saving grace. But that is followed by spiritual growth and grace until in a moment of full consecration and complete surrender on our part, God purifies and cleanses our heart. This is an experience referred to as entire sanctification. However, even following that moment of full consecration to God, we continue to grow in grace, and we never stop growing as long as we live. When we respond in faith to seeking grace, we receive saving grace. There's a radical reorientation of our priorities, a reconstituting of our desires, and the power and work of the Holy Spirit is set loose in our life. But rather than an instant liberation from every harmful habit, character flaw, or bad disposition we've ever possessed, God continues to work in us to shape us into what he wants us to be. The goal of all discipleship that is Christian 
is becoming more and more like Jesus. That's why the Apostle Paul reminds us, just we don't expect babies to remain babies. Just as we want them to grow and mature into fully functioning adults, we should also expect that we don't stay spiritual babies either. Spiritual growth begins at salvation, but we continue to grow in grace through our whole lives. We should look and act and think more like Christ next year than we do today. And so we progress by sanctifying grace. Two, spiritual growth involves more than just time. Most of my friends don't know that I can play the piano. I've been playing the piano for over 40 years now. When I was 10, I practiced almost every day with a lot of supervision from my mother, who prioritized piano practice over football. Now I play with much less frequency. I only play about once a year. If someone were to ask me how long I've played the piano, I would tell them four decades. The problem is, I haven't been intentional about practicing. There are children at church who have only played the piano for a few years who can play better than I can, even though I have been playing the piano much longer. It's no different with our spiritual lives. Simply being exposed to information doesn't mean that people absorb it and understand it and embrace it and live it. While it is true that spiritual growth takes time, it is not true that sanctifying grace is merely a product of time or even a byproduct of mere exposure to Christian culture. Churches are full of people who have spent years as Christians, yet their lives reflect very little of the Spirit of Jesus. They're critical and cranky, cynical and negative and selfish. The reason is very simple, and this is number three. Spiritual growth is not so much a question of time as it is cooperation with God and intentional training. The writer to the Hebrews says that some Christians who should be eating spiritual meat are still drinking baby milk. And the reason that is given is that they haven't been trained by practice to distinguish between good from evil. Therefore, Hebrews says, let us go on to perfection and leave behind the elementary teachings about the Christian life. The path to eating a grown-up diet and becoming a mature Christian is through training in righteousness, training that helps us to recognize the difference between right and wrong and distinguish between even good and better. That phrase, trained by practice, is intriguing. It simply implies intentional effort and that Christians participate in our spiritual growth in Christ. This is accomplished through specific practices or what we sometimes call means of grace, such as prayer, reading the scriptures, fasting, attending worship, participating in the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper. We'll talk more about that later, but we must be careful not to confuse participation with control. We do not control our spiritual growth or even cause it. There are some things within our control. We can make a phone call, we can wash our clothes, we can run an errand. There are also things about which we can do nothing. We cannot change the weather. We cannot change our genetics. There are things we can control and those we cannot. Both exist. However, there is a third category. The things we do not control, but that we can cooperate with. For example, think about sleep. If you've ever had children, you know that there comes a point where you have to tell them, go to sleep. Sometimes they'll respond by saying, I can't go to sleep. And they're partially right. They cannot make themselves go to sleep in the same way that you can make a phone call. As parents, we assure our kids they can do some things to open themselves to sleep. They can help prepare for sleep. They can lay down on a soft bed. They can turn out the lights and close their eyes and listen to soft music. And sleep will come. They cannot control it, but they're not helpless either. They can open themselves up to it and sleep quietly sneaks up on them. The same is true of spiritual growth. We cannot sanctify ourselves or make ourselves like Jesus. The Holy One is the one who makes us holy. God is our sanctifier. But as in our salvation, 
cooperation is necessary. We do not save ourselves, but we must say yes to saving grace. Eminent discipleship teacher Dallas Willard, he famously said, grace is not opposed to effort, it's opposed to earning. We cooperate with the active grace of God by reordering our lives around those activities, disciplines, and practices that were modeled by Jesus Christ. And we participate in them not to earn our sanctification, but in order to accomplish through training what we cannot now do by trying harder. And number four, spiritual growth is a communal effort. One of the most surprising aspects of Paul's description of the journey of grace is that we cannot travel the road alone. Accountability, encouragement, admonition, intercessory prayer, and support are impossible apart from other people. We become a holy people together. We hear the voice of God most clearly in community. Love is superficial until it is lived out in the context of real relationships. The journey of grace is a team event. So here's the holiness equation. Sanctifying grace plus cooperation with God plus Christian community equals Christ-likeness. Christians are called to grow in grace, which is another way to say that we are to grow into the likeness of Jesus. We receive new life from Christ so that we can grow up in Christ. God remakes, God remodels. It is sanctifying grace. God not only saves us, he transforms us. He accepts us where we are, but loves us enough not to leave us there. He reimagines, remakes, and remodels us. When we offer ourselves in complete consecration, and full surrender to God the Father, God the Holy Spirit cleanses and purifies our hearts, remaking us into the image of God the Son. We become Christ-like in our thoughts, our words, and deeds. Not a corner of our life is shut off from the control of Jesus Christ. And we take our hands off the steering wheel, and we let Jesus call the shots and give the orders. We say, you have been my Savior, salvation, now I bow my knee and I make you my Lord, sanctification. We are set apart for a holy purpose and God's perfect love begins to flow through us. We begin to love God truly with all our heart and mind and strength and our neighbor as ourselves. This is sanctifying grace. Join us next session to discover more about the next aspect of our journey of grace, sustaining grace.